I was just going to share a little bit about this uh, membership meeting. Um, it has been postponed till October the 6th. Um, an agenda has been put in your mailboxes this morning for what the agenda will be for there. I think it's a pretty full agenda, pretty big, important, uh, important things that we need to discuss. So I guess that's why we postponed it, just so we can be well prepared to to talk about these things. And uh, yeah, you can just keep praying for it, and we will meet again on October 6th at 7 o'clock. If you have any questions about that, you can feel free to call me on them or talk to me. Yeah. I guess I'd just like to announce that since we're not having membership meeting this coming Tuesday, we will have prayer meeting as per our normal Tuesday prayer meeting. So let's keep that in mind. Well, thank you, George, for leading us in worship, and thank you, worship team, for um, uh, leading us in worship and song. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to gather together and, and do that together as believers in Christ, to worship our God and Savior uh, together in song and in prayer. And uh, we've just done that right now. Let's bow. I'm going to ask the Lord's help. Father, I just pray that the words of my mouth, the thoughts of my mind, would be acceptable in your sight and that it would produce the fruit in the lives of us all that you want to see, that uh, it wouldn't return to you void, your truth, but it would accomplish the purpose for which you sent it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A number of years ago, the conversation of Christ's return came up amongst a number of Bible college students, and there was some speculation as to when it is going to be and what are some signs that Christians should be looking for. And one, one person added that we shouldn't be looking for signs because the return of, the, of Christ to rapture his church is imminent. That means it can happen at any time, any second. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it is going to happen within the next year or even five years or even 50 years. And so that conversation carried on in regard to different world events and the that some thought might be indicators of Christ's soon return. And then a very honest young lady commented that she was looking forward to it, but she hoped that Jesus wouldn't return until after she was married. You see, she was engaged to be married and was so looking forward to her marriage, and she knew that she would not be married in heaven. And so being very honest, she was hoping that Jesus wouldn't return for at least another six months. Now we may chuckle at that mindset of this young lady, but I think if we're honest, there have been times in our lives when we have been anticipating some good and pleasant thing uh, that's about to happen to us in our lives. And uh, we just assume that Jesus hold off on his return, uh, at least for just a little while, until that special thing that we've been anticipating happens to us. And yes, for sure, we want to go to heaven, we want to be with our Savior and God, but we don't want to miss out on some of the good things of life that God has allowed people to enjoy during their sojourn on this earth. And I think we have thoughts like that because we have a hard time imagining the splendor of being in the presence of our God. You know, the Apostle Paul told the Ephesian Christians that God is able to do far more abundantly than anything we could ask for or even think of. And since that's true, we know that our imagination is just the starting point for the wonderful joy and excitement that God has prepared for his children. Actually, the Apostle Paul quoted the prophet Isaiah when he wrote to the Corinthian Christians saying, things <clears throat> which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. So Paul is reminding believers that God has prepared things beyond what we've ever seen, what we've ever heard, what we can even imagine. We just can't imagine how good it's going to be is probably the reason that we sometimes have desires for the Lord to hold off 
on his return. Until we've experienced the some good and pleasant, uh, pleasurable thing that we're anticipating. Well, the young Christians in Thessalonica had been taught about Christ's return. They knew a little bit about the truth that Jesus will return to this earth, not just as Savior, but as conquering King and righteous Judge. But the Thessalonians also had some misunderstandings about some of the events at Christ's return, and they needed some things clarified about it. Also, they needed some things clarified about their eternal salvation. And that is part of the reason that the Apostle Paul wrote them this first letter that is recorded in our Bible. Just to recap some of the things about this Thessalonian church, it was started by Paul, Silas, and Timothy on Paul's second missionary journey. It would have been the first for Silas and Timothy, but this was Paul's second missionary journey around 50 AD. That's about 20 years after the death and resurrection and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. So some time has passed since that event, but it's still fairly fresh in a lot of believers' minds, the death, resurrection, and ascension of the Lord Jesus. Just like many of you here today can remember what's happened 20 years ago, the year 2000. Some of you remember what happened then, don't you? What were we all worried about in the year 2000? Y2K, yeah, we were all going to run out of electricity and all the computers were going to shut down and things were just going to go, go haywire. Okay? That was, that was what was going to happen. And, and a few computers did go wonky, yeah, but our electricity still kept on and, and so forth. And everybody who bought generators, well, they had a generator for when the power went out because of ice and snow and wind and so forth and thunderstorms. So that, was, that was, wasn't money wasted, I guess. But, but that was, we, we can all look back at some events and probably some of you will remember some other things, memorable things that happened. 20 years ago. And so it's been about 20 years since Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. Paul's on his second missionary journey. He has stopped in the city of Thessalonica. Well, he was there only a few weeks. He was uh, there, you know, we, we read in Acts 16 or 17 that he was there for, you know, uh, three weeks, that he went to the, the Jewish synagogue and, and reasoned with the Jewish people in, in the synagogues. But he probably was there longer because he also ministered to Gentile people because we know a good number of Gentile people from Thessalonica became believers as well. So, but they had to leave right away because of persecutions. There was tremendous hostility towards them by some very militant Jewish people in the city of Thessalonica. They had to leave by cover of darkness. The, the young Christians uh, escorted them out of town for their own safety. Well, these young Thessalonian believers were a persecuted church. That was the beginning of the persecutions. And uh, at first it was the militant Jewish people. But think of it, it wasn't that many years until systematic persecution by the Roman Empire came upon not only this group of believers, but all Christians within the Roman Empire. You know, this is the year 50 AD. By the year 64 AD, that persecution isn't going to be just from Jewish people. That's the least of their concern. It's going to be by the Roman Empire. You know, it would last until 313 AD. Think of it for a bit. If somebody says, you know, in, in, in a few years, persecution is going to come to can Canadian churches. And if uh, somebody told you, well, it's, it's going to last a while. It's going to last for another 250 years. You'd be kind of discouraged about that, wouldn't you? That would be something, oh, no, how can we ever, how is this ever going to work? We're tired of COVID after six months. Well, talk about persecution for another 250 years. But that's what was ahead of these believers. Well, they were a persecuted church, but they also had some struggles of their own, not from persecution without uh, some were struggling with leaving sexual immorality of their old lives. The culture that they lived in promoted sexual immorality. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And uh, we can kind of take from 
Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, which was somewhat, uh, would be their similar conditions, they're in the same country. Corinth was about 570 kilometers south of Thessalonica. But I, I assume that moral conditions weren't that much different from one city to another within that Greek culture. So if you turn your Bibles, if you have your Bibles with you, I would encourage you to turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll see what, what kind of, uh, what, what the moral culture was like for these people, the, the, the culture that they had come out of. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to start reading at verse 9, where Paul writes to them, he says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Some of these believers, they had trouble leaving their old lives behind. And Paul, so Paul, in this letter and in, the, in a subsequent letter, has to address something. Sexual immorality was one of them. Some of the Thessalonians were given to laziness. We find they were relying on the charity of other believers instead of doing honest work to provide for their own needs and for the needs of those who couldn't work for themselves. And in this area, they needed correction, and the Apostle Paul gives that to them in, uh, in chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, and he does it again in his second letter to the Thessalonians. He needed to reaffirm, you know, you know you're, some of you are just waiting for the day of the Lord and not preparing, not working for your own needs and the needs of your family. And, and, and Paul rebuked them for that. But overall, the Thessalonians were actually doing pretty good in their newfound faith. They were growing spiritually. There had been a dramatic change in the lives of many of these believers, and it was noticed by their community members and also from, by people from a wider area. In fact, Paul tells them, you know, the people in Macedonia and even in the neighboring province of Achaia are all talking about how you turn from idols to serve the living and true God. There had been a big change. Not everything had changed, but they, God had done a, a dramatic work despite having missionaries in their city for only a very, very short time. Also, the Thessalonian believers' love for one another was well known. Uh, verse 9 of chapter 4, Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. So they're doing really, really well at demonstrating practical ways of demonstrating love towards each other as believers in the family of God. And that's commendable. That's really commendable. And But they had some misunderstandings about Christ's return, and that's what Paul addresses in chapter 4, verses 13, to chapter 5, verse 11. That's what we're going to be looking at today. You see, it, see, it seems that at least some of the Thessalonians had the wrong idea that if you died before Jesus returned, then you wouldn't experience that all those who remained alive until the return of Jesus would experience. And they thought that those who had died would be missing out in some way. Now Jesus promised the repentant thief while he was dying on the cross, he promised the repentant thief on the cross that he, the, the thief, would be with Jesus that very same day in paradise. The Apostle Paul also wrote to the Corinthians and the Philippians, reminding them of the truth that to be absent from the body, to die, as a believer in Christ, is to be present with the Lord, to be immediately in the presence of Jesus. So that at the death, at death the spirit of a believer is immediately ushered into the presence of the Lord in paradise. But at least some of the Thessalonians had missed that part. And so when some of their brothers and sisters began to die, they began to mourn like those who have no hope. But Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, clarifies this misunderstanding for them. 
See, Paul and Silas and Timothy don't want these dear brothers and sisters to be uninformed, or I think George's King James translation read, I would not have you ignorant brethren. Years ago I heard, maybe I read it in one of his books, I think it was Warren Wiersbe, I think he used to speak on Back to the Bible on the radio, he says, uh, he thought that the largest denomination in the world was the ignorant brethren because they didn't, weren't aware of God's word, they weren't aware of God's truth. And although we kind of snicker at that, it's probably right, right? It's people who, who don't understand because they haven't spent the time in God's word to know God's truth. And that's kind of sad. But Paul doesn't want the Thessalonians unaware, uninformed, or ignorant of the truth that's going to make their lives a whole lot better. Give them a whole lot more hope. He doesn't want them to be unaware. So he, he uh, where am I here? He tells them, he, he explains to them what's going to be happening in, uh, in these, these verses from chapter 4, verses 13 to 18 about the order, what's going to be happening to uh, those who have put their faith in Christ and who have, and who have passed away. The souls of those believers, their physical bodies are in the presence of the Lord. And uh, those believers who have died are going to be a part of Christ's return in a way that we who are alive and remain won't be. Their spirits are already with the Lord. They will descend with the Lord. And uh, this will be part, the Lord will descend. This is not, this part of the uh, Lord's return is not all the way down to this earth. The physical bodies of those departed believers will be raised from the graves before the bodies of the alive and remain believe, remaining believers are caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So the spirits of departed believers are there with the Lord. They're coming down at least part way, it would seem, and their bodies will be resurrected before those who are alive and remain will be reunited. Their bodies will be glorified. They will be changed in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We read that it will happen in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. It's all going to happen really fast. Uh, there's going to be a trumpet. The Lord will call with the voice of an archangel. And that doesn't take very long, and then, you know, we who are alive and remain will be caught up, uh, raptured, so to speak, sucked up off this earth into the presence of our Lord. And that's, that's, that's remarkable to me. Because, you know, God's salvation includes the redemption of our physical bodies, not just our eternal souls. Um, we're all going to have glorified bodies. We're going to, when we read Philippians, we're going to find out that our body will be like the body of our risen Lord Jesus Christ. It'll be a glorified body. It won't get sick anymore. It won't feel pain anymore. It won't have the limitations that our physical bodies down here on earth have. And I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that. The older I get. <laughs> the more I'm looking forward to a glorified body that doesn't have the sin-cursed limitations of our physical bodies here on this earth. Well, at that point, there will be a grand reunion of Christ and his followers. And I believe that uh, this reunion is going to take place somewhere between heaven and earth. And then this vast multitude of redeemed saints who will return to heaven with Christ. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Isn't that great? That is, that's the culmination of our faith. That, that's, that's the fulfillment of our salvation. Okay. And he goes on in verse 18, Therefore comfort one another with these words. 
You know, for the believer, these truths should be of great comfort because death is the great separator. It separates people from their loved ones. But Christ has provided a way for reunification. For the believer in Christ, that day when Christ returns will be a glorious reunion day. We will be seeing our Lord face to face, the one who hung on a cross for us. And that will be the greatest reunion, but there will be a tremendous bonus, and that reunion will be with all of God's people through all the ages. You know, I used to think that I was looking forward to the return of our Lord, and I guess I was to a degree. But when our family was shaken to our core a few years ago with the passing of our son, Matt, it gave me a new appreciation for the imminent return of our Savior. That longing for reunification gave us a new appreciation that our Lord could return at any moment. The Apostle Paul continues to speak on the subject of Christ's return in the first 11 verses of chapter 5, and he seems to remember speaking to these young believers about this subject, and he reminds them that these are truths that they already know. Verses 1 and 2, he says to them, Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. It will be a surprise. You can click the next one there, Emily. It will be unexpected by those who are unbelievers. Jesus spoke about this to his followers during the Passion Week just before his crucifixion. Turn, if you will, to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, the whole chapter is about, I'm just going to read two verses or three verses from, from verse 42 to 44, where Jesus encouraged his followers to be ready for his coming. He says, Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know the day your Lord is coming, but be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would have not allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. People will be continuing in their daily lives without the thought that Christ's return could ever happen. And earlier in that chapter, Jesus describes it will be like the days of Noah, eating and drinking and celebrating marriages until Noah entered the ark and the rain started to fall. Jesus goes on in that chapter of Matthew 24 saying, well, two men will be working side by side in a field. One will be taken, the other will be left. Two women will be working at a flour mill. One will be taken, the other one will be left behind. And though the word rapture is never used in the New Testament, that concept is definitely throughout the New Testament. And this rapture is part of God's final working in this world. Because the day of the Lord is a whole series of events that will culminate in God's children enjoying eternal life with Him in the new heaven and the earth, and also the judgment and punishment of Satan and his followers in eternal hell. This day of the Lord will usher in eternity as a whole series of events. And this part of the day of the Lord will be a surprise to the unbelieving people of this world. You know, after, if we look at the Great Tribulation as described in the book of Revelation, it is hard for me to understand how the appearance of Christ could be a surprise after all the calamitous events that take place on this earth. And uh, in, uh, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, we read that when people finally do see the Lord coming, that every eye will behold him, and they will mourn over him. There is not celebration, there is mourning, because their doom is sure. 
You know, probably the biggest reason that I believe that the rapture will take place before the Great Tribulation is because it's going to be such a surprise. Even if it will happen um, some point during the Tribulation or after the Tribulation, all those calamitous events should be some kind of signal to the world that, that Christ's return is coming, or is, is imminent, is right there. No, there are believers, many godly believers, who believe the rapture will happen midway through the tribulation or at the end of it, and they may be right. But I believe for it to be a surprise as described in this passage, it makes much more sense to come before the horrific calamities of the great tribulation. Christ's imminent return should not be a surprise to believers in the way it surprises the rest of the world. In one sense, it will be a surprise. We do not know the day or the hour when Jesus will come. Not all, even the angels know that. But we can be prepared for his coming by looking for, anticipating the return of Christ. And Paul told the Thessalonian believers that they were not in darkness so that the day of Christ's return would surprise them or overtake them like a thief. Verse 4. You see, unbelievers will have the mindset that the world is moving toward getting better and better. Verse 3 says, while they are saying peace and safety. Isn't that seemingly the desire of the world as a whole? Is We want to be secure. We want to be safe. We want to have peace. We don't want to have war. We don't want to have climate change. We want everything. We want to have no uh, control over diseases and things like we We want to just make this a better and better and better place for our children and grandchildren so that you know we can leave the planet a better place. Peace and safety. And while the world is pursuing this peace and safety, all of a sudden destruction overtakes them. Comes on suddenly like birth pangs, like labor pangs of the woman who's about to give birth. It can be a surprise. Okay. Paul goes on to describe that, that uh, unbelievers as in darkness or as of the night in contrast with Christ's followers who are sons of light or sons of the day. He goes on to say, night is when most of us do our sleeping. Amen? No, some would say, no, I don't sleep at night. I just toss and turn. Oh, I, yeah, I get, I get that sometimes. But most of us go to bed at night unless you have a night shift job or you're doing shift work or whatever. Most of us, you know, try to go to bed at nighttime. That's our, our normal rhythms. And also, if you're in a drinking crowd, and you probably know some people who are, most of them do their drinking at night. I, you know, I have a few friends who are in that kind of crowd, but they're, you know, I, I don't know of any of them that ever invite their drinking buddies over and say, well, you know, we're going to have a party at 7 o'clock on Saturday morning. Be there. That usually doesn't happen. Okay? But it doesn't matter whether you are asleep or whether you are drunk. You're in no shape to be anticipating and to respond should something surprise you like a thief in the night. You're not ready for it. You're out of it. You're drowsy, whatever. And that's the analogy that Paul, we're, as children of the day, we're not supposed to be like that. We're supposed to be ready when the Lord returns. And the Apostle Paul puts on, gives the Thessalonians how to be ready. He starts at verse 8. Let's read that. But since we are of the day, let us be sober having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. These both have to do with salvation. Being in God's family is the only way to be ready for His return. It doesn't matter how good a person you are or what the neighbors think of you. But if you're outside of God's family at His return, you're not ready. You're not ready. Both of these have to do with salvation. Be sure your confidence is in Christ the Savior and trust only in His provision for the forgiveness, for, for your forgiveness and acceptance into His family. You know how tragic it is for people 
who may be even grown up in, in a good Bible-believing church. And after many years have the belief that it is still through their own self-effort that they can gain God's approval, God's forgiveness. Or maybe they're under the illusion that they're even a need, in need of His forgiveness. You know, some people believe that. I'm not a sinner. I haven't done nothing wrong. You've probably heard that in talking to people. I'm a pretty good person. I don't do such and such like so and so. I'm good. Yeah, you know, you, I, I don't know if that you've encountered that, but I have. People try to really convince you of, of their of their level of righteousness. Well, Paul wraps up this section on Christ's return by reminding these new believers that as people who have put their faith in Christ, they are not destined for God's wrath, but they are destined for God's grace, for God's goodness, for God's salvation. Verse 9, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with Him. Our salvation is only possible through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that whether we live until He returns or whether we die before He returns, we will live together with Him for all eternity. Those who have passed away before Christ returns to this earth will not be missing anything. They're not missing out. I'm encouraged by that because, to be honest with you, not long ago, there were times when I had some of those thoughts. When our son Matt passed away, we would have, oh, boy, boy, wouldn't Matt enjoy this now? When we would go, you know, do something or partake of something that we knew he would enjoy because that was, we knew his personality, okay? And I, sometimes I had the feeling of, 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 of how he was missing out of the good things that he anticipated that he would be doing as he would grow older. He talked of working at Bible camp, uh, about getting his driver's license, about buying a quad, and then buying my old truck off of me so he could drag that old quad, or that quad around to different places he wanted to go quad. About graduating from high school, and his plan was to work year after high school to earn enough money so that he could go to Bible college or do a YWAM uh, school of discipleship or something like that. About finding a, a good wife, getting married, having kids, and, and serving God in whatever ministry God led him to. And all of these were normal and good things for him to anticipate and to enjoy when the time came. But the truth of the matter is that all of those good things pale in comparison to the joy and the pleasure that he is experiencing right now in the presence of his Savior. He's not missing out. Many of you have loved ones who you've said, boy, wouldn't so-and-so, you know, your husband or your son or your wife or, or loved one, Boy, we know that they would be enjoying this moment right now. And they probably would if they were on this earth. But it pales in comparison. To what God has in store for those who love Him. I has not seen ear has not heard. It has not entered into the heart of man all that God has prepared for those who love him. I'm looking forward to the day when the Lord returns to rapture his church. That's when the entire fullness of our salvation will be fulfilled. And I anticipate that day. And I hope you do as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words of encouragement. 
that uh, heaven is beyond all that we can ask or think. That being with you is, is beyond anything that has entered the heart of man. Anything we've seen, heard, or imagined. We thank you for the hope that brings. We thank you, Lord, for taking us to heaven immediately, to be in your presence and enjoy you the second that we draw our last breath. If our faith has been in our Savior Jesus, we thank you for those promises, Lord. Help us to live in light of your coming. In Jesus' name, amen. In closing, since our worship team is not with us, I thought we would sing an a cappella song that relates to our Lord's return. Uh, number 313 in your hymn books, When We See Christ. If you're able, you can stand. If it's not, you can remain seated. Okay, I'm going to try to sing it without piano, and uh, hope you all, if you can sing harmony, that would be great, because that does. Uh, of times the day seems long, our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur and despair. But Christ will soon appear to catch his bride away. All tears forever over. In God's eternal day, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face, all sorrow will race so bravely run the race till we see Christ sometimes the sky looks dark without a ray of light we're trust and driven on no human help in sight but there is one in heaven who knows our deepest care. Let Jesus solve your problem. Just go to him in prayer. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trial will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Life's day will soon be o'er, all storms forever past. We'll cross the great divide to glory safe at last. We'll share the joys of heaven, a heart, a home, a crown. The tempter will be banished, we'll lay our burden down. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race 
till we see Christ. Depart in peace. May God bless you.